Um, now, met this guy uh, when I was first president of the IPA, and one of the things I said to him, although very delicately, was more or less everything you won a Nobel Prize for economics for was actually discovered by the advertising industry at some point in the previous 50 years. Um, that actually, if you look at great ads like, for instance, how else can a month's salary last a lifetime for De Beers engagement rings? Uh, completely unrealistic, in my opinion. But it's still an example of price anchoring, a brilliant and genius example of anchoring. Discovered again, sort of 50 years, I think it was the late 40s, uh, you know, 50 or 60 years before behavioural economics discovered it. I mentioned this to someone else, and they said, no, 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 actually, progress always works like that. Uh, industry and commerce gets there first in every case. Um, two examples, uh, Stevenson was developing perfectly workable steam engines before anybody had a clue um, uh, about uh, thermodynamics. Uh, it, it wasn't helped by the fact that uh, Stevenson had such a strong Geordie accent that when he actually visited London, he was accompanied, I'm not making this up, he was accompanied by an interpreter. Um, so it was probably difficult for him to kind of uh, evangelise, uh, you know, a fucking great boiler on the twat, you know, etc. But similarly, until 1948, the Wright Brothers flyer, produced by effectively two bicycle repairmen from Ohio, go, woo, thank you, thank you, um, uh, sat in the Science Museum in London because it was too embarrassing for the Americans to have it in the Smithsonian. And the reason was the Americans had a huge academically backed programme to develop powered flight for military purposes. And it completely failed, whereas these two amateur tinkerers and engineers effectively succeeded. And so it was only in about 1948 that the uh, Americans were prepared to have the thing back because it was almost an affront to a failed huge government program. And apparently it always works like this. Business gets there first, it actually makes the discoveries through stochastic experimentation and instinct. Where it's rubbish is at codifying what it finds. And I think this is one of the reasons why AdMap is so vital, that we do generally discover extraordinary things. We kind of made discoveries about choice architecture about uh, you know, 20 years ago in direct marketing. And we knew that very, very strange things happened when you changed the way that choice was presented. But we never really got down to properly codifying it. But there's an interesting thing where the following day after we met him at the IPA, Kahneman spoke at the Hay Festival, and someone actually said to him, D referring to the distinction between system one and system two, system one being the instinctive, automatic, effortless part of the brain, someone actually from the audience, not me, asked, are there any system one businesses? And he paused for a second or two and he said, actually, yes. He said, advertising. And he paused for a little longer and then said, and politics. <laughs> you, can, you can draw from that what you like. But my contention is that if we start to codify what we've learned, we already know it instinctively in many cases. We've already learnt it almost by accident or by just native genius. If we codify it, the real aim for the future of this business is not to make it more efficient, sorry, um, but actually to make it bigger. And so the whole point of Ogilvy Change, as I said, is all we want to do is get the kind of briefs and solve the kind of problems that traditionally ad agencies are never asked to solve. And I think there is a huge opportunity here, I mean, a massive opportunity. Part of the problem is the ad agency still has a very strong muscle memory uh, of the days when money came as, in the form of media commission. And the muscle memory still is retained. So there's a natural assumption in agencies to go, well, we can solve this problem, but first we have to redefine it in such a way that the solution involves a lot of bought media. And I think it's taking time for that kind of instinct to actually uh, finally become a bit dissipated. And so what we've done recently is uh, tweaked call centre scripts where you can triple the conversion rate in a call centre by adding two sentences to the script. One of them simply being, most people choose option B. If you're asking people to choose on a phone call, simply a little bit of what you might call herd effect or um, you know, the, the, the um, uh, social default, uh, that tiny little cue will help you triple the conversion rate. People go, I don't know which I should have, but if most people do that, well, I've got a convenient, happy default. That's the kind of effect you can have. The second thing was going out to Chile to reduce the risk of food contamination in a Chilean food plant. Now, I'd like to tell you what the answer was. It was very ingenious. It wasn't mine. It was uh, a 25-year-old psychologist. But the client wants to patent the idea. And I think the opportunity for, if, once we understand that we're a system one business and we better understand the workings of system one, the opportunity to grow the scope of this business is really fantastic. And I'm not completely alone in this. This is a book, quite an interesting one, Complexity in the Art of Public Policy. I mean, the first acknowledgement is, uh, as you all have understood doing economics at Cambridge, is that 
Most microeconomic theory about how people actually think, decide, and act is either dangerously simplistic or, in some cases, diametrically wrong. A friend of mine did economics at Cambridge where he was told um, by his uh, supervisor, he said, the problem with American economists, he said, is they're so good at economics, they think it's true. <laughs> and this is a book by two guys, Kuypers and Colander, who understand that human behaviour is a complex system. And they say individuals who think of problems in other often more creative ways, language majors, history scholars, humanists, artists, are discounted or even labelled irrational. We think this is a big loss. Humanists might not be able to translate their insights into the maths underlying the standard policy compass, but they have important insights that have been lost to policy. Until these insights are recovered, we'll be unable to effectively deal with the intertwined problems of the age. So there you go. Now, I genuinely think that one of the things I'd like the business to do is to become more aggressive about cases where apparently rational people with seemingly logical arguments do things which are effectively an affront to system one. Where you design a world that's perfect for a sort of system two brain, but which is just instinctively awful. I'll give you an example. 52 billion is spent every year effectively in tax rebates for pension contributions. About 30 billion of this is needed to overcome the fact that the pension is the single worst designed financial product you could possibly imagine. If you'd asked the world's greatest psychologists to design a financial product that held absolutely no appeal to anybody under the age of 60, they couldn't have done a better job. <laughs> okay? I actually asked an audience of 500 people who work for the largest retail bank in the UK, I said, how many of you in the room if I gave you 200 quid, could top that up into your pension before you got home this evening? Nobody knew. Okay? Asked another audience of 300 people, one person knew. Who are you? I said. He worked for Goldman Sachs. So he wasn't exactly representative of the public. So you create a product which is instinctively, no one will ever put money into their pension because it's difficult to do. If you put money into your pension, let's say you did pay that 200 pounds in, how would you know the money got there? You'd have to wait for three months until that incomprehensible heap of documents arrived through the post, remembered you'd paid in £200, and remembered a cheque. Now, there's one thing I'll explain a bit later. The human brain instinctively, system one, absolutely hates uncertainty. There's some arguments that you can actually make people unhappy by saying there's a 20% chance I might be able to get you tickets to the Wimbledon men's final. That they'd actually be happier not having them than with a small but uncertain chance of good news. That's how strong the effect is. You can understand the evolutionary reasons for it. Get out of any circumstance which feels uncertain. Um, other behaviours that are fascinating. Looking to nature for inspiration. And this is a really important point. One of the most important things you can do is find something which works in business but which makes no sense in logic. Because nobody else has done it. Test counterintuitive things because your competitors won't. And there's a lesson here from nature. Um, bees do a thing called the waggle dance. When they found pollen, uh, they go back to the hive, and by doing a dance at a particular angle up the wall of the hive, they transmit information back to the other bees um, as to where the pollen's to be found, what distance and what direction. What bee experts discovered to their surprise is that 20% of the bees, it varies a bit, but I'll, let's say 20%, basically ignore this information and go off and do their own thing. I thought this is a bit strange. You would have thought over 50 million years, bee accountants and bee compliance officers would have evolved <laughs> to increase the efficiency of pollen collection. And in the short term, of course, 100% compliance would actually increase the efficiency. Until they modelled it mathematically and found that without the 20% of punk bees, the hive would starve to death because it would be unable to adapt to changing environmental conditions. It would get trapped in a local maximum, and when new pollen appeared somewhere else, it would never get to find out about it. So also, an optimal failure rate is a really interesting question, but the other point is test counterintuitive things. Um, this is the greatest attempt to uh, compete with Coke. In terms of the two things that are conventionally used to make sense of human behaviour, which is one, market research, and two, economic logic, this defies all logic. In taste tests, by the way, the company which researched it, which specialises in, in taste tests on carbonated drinks, said, we have never seen anything do worse in any taste test ever. Um, consume, respondents' quotes included things like, I wouldn't drink this piss if you paid me to. <laughs> the other extraordinary thing is, how do they charge three times as much? Now, this is where you really need to understand system one and its logic. How do you charge three times as much as you do for Coke, which is the world's most popular soft drink? Uh, you make the can smaller. 
And something about the system one brain goes, that drink must be really, really potent because they've got to put it in a small can. If I drank a whole, you know, 750 uh, milliliters, I'd probably go do lally or die or something. <laughs> so the small can actually conveyed strength. Now, nowhere in market research, okay, nowhere in economic logic will you find the inspiration for this decision. No one in research will ever say, no, there's no way I'm paying £1.50 for a canned drink. Oh, wait, I would if you gave me less of it. OK? <laughs> so the understanding of system one logic is really vital to everything. This is my latest bit of work for Ogilvy Change. The design of choice is often appalling. Airline websites ask you, what class do you want to travel? Before you know what the price difference is. That's none of, we all want to go first, if it's 20 quid more. If it's 2,000 quid more, we probably don't. No one realises how weird it is to ask a question before the necessary information is provided to help you answer it. And you find the world is full of really bad choice architecture because instinctively we're really, really bad at understanding it. Now, anybody here ever driven down the M20 from Dover and needed to turn onto the M25 and miss the turning? OK, we've got two, three, four. I have never had an audience where no one... Now, the strange thing is I had an audience in Johannesburg two weeks ago where someone said, I've made that mistake, OK? <laughs> now, it was only after the fifth time I missed the turning that I thought, maybe it's not me. Maybe I'm not a total idiot. Maybe there's a badly designed piece of choice architecture. Now, there is the gantry which tells you which lane you need to get in. By the time you can read that sign, you are there. <laughs> OK? So the only way of getting back into the right lane is by basically making a high-speed illegal manoeuvre by swerving over the painted area. There's actually a case where a signpost is placed about 400 yards later than the position it needs to be to enable you to make the choice. And so understanding choice architecture is one thing. Understanding the fact that actually humans do not react according to individual maximised utility. I have a personal beef against wine because I just don't think it's that good as a drink. OK? <laughs> it's partly as a reaction to having endless drinks parties where you have that, what Kingsley Amis called the three worst words in the English language, which are red or white. OK? <laughs> Go to a restaurant, you think you have a choice about what to drink. This is how the choice works. There are already wine glasses on the table when you sit down. Pretty clear nudge there, OK? Then what happens is you're handed a thing which is a list of drinks, but it's not called a drinks list. If you notice that, it's called a wine list. And the choice architecture of the wine list is designed so you have eight pages of wine, and then the back page is for the perverts or deviants <laughs> who actually want to drink alcoholic drinks produced by civilizations that have mastered the art of distillation or brewing, OK? <laughs> But that's like the ninth page for the weirdos. But then there's the final act of genius which exploits social network theory. To a table of six or eight, they only hand out one wine list. Now, once you've handed that to one person, there's only one drink you can order for a whole table of eight people. So the second that guy says red or white, OK, it's game over for anybody who wants to drink tequila slammers all evening. <laughs> okay? Basically, your choice has been frozen away from you before you are even aware of the fact. And the reason the restaurants want to serve wine is wine has no known price anchor, so you can mark it up absurdly. You buy a bottle of Chateau d'Obscur for £4.50, and you charge 40 quid for it, and everybody will pretend to like it anyway because it costs 40 quid. Okay? <laughs> But understanding the way in which we choose is fascinating. Here's another thing which we really need to understand, which actually wasn't discovered, as far as I know, in advertising, but it's a very, very interesting thing. Richard Thaler, you're on a beach, uh, you're in the Caribbean, it's pretty hot. OK? And your friend says, I'm just off to get you a bottle of chilled Heineken. It's a named beer and it's chilled. From that place, quarter of a mile down the beach. Tell me how much you're prepared to pay. And if it's less than that price, I'll bring you a bottle. And if it's more, uh, if the price they quote is more, I won't buy one. What he found was extraordinary that in the case that the place was named as a boutique hotel, people were prepared to pay about $5.30. This is a few years old. If you named the place as that beach bar, shack, down the beach, people's price they were prepared to pay is $3. Economic utility, therefore, goes completely out of the window. The bottle of chilled Heineken, the, the utility value is presumably identical to you in both cases. What Thaler said is there are two parts to any transaction. There's transaction utility and there's acquisition utility. The acquisition utility is identical in this case, the pleasure of drinking the beer. There is also the sense that you have got a good deal in the purchase. People accept the fact that a boutique hotel has higher overheads. They therefore pay more for it. It's got nothing to do with the actual pleasure of the item. It's got to do with how it feels to make the transaction. Now, until you understand that distinction, lots and lots of things don't make sense. 
Uh, Christmas doesn't make sense, really. You buy presents for people which have a high acquisition utility, but are generally a painful or guilt-inducing to buy. You know, luxuries and treats. Okay. It also explains why actually people prefer having boots advantage points to having the cash equivalent. This is true, because you can guiltlessly spend them on extravagances, which you can't do with money which is fungible. These are some of the things we're starting to understand. And we can deploy them in ways, if you want people to finish their antibiotics, we can apply them completely unconsciously, we can talk entirely to system one, if we like. If you want people to finish their antibiotics, don't give them 24 white pills, give them 18 white pills and 6 blue ones, and say, when you finish the white pills, take the blue ones. Everybody will finish the course. It's just a mental instinct called chunking. And just to give you a few examples, here are five things which generally don't emerge very much in research and which economics is completely blind to in most cases, but which are extraordinarily potent drivers of uh, human behaviour and preference. Status, certainty, autonomy, relatedness, fairness. There are more. But no business decision should be taken with pure reference to economics without actually considering the effect of these incredibly potent things. Certainty, if you look at Halo or Uber, you could always phone for a taxi. There's nothing particularly revolutionary about the speed at which thing, uh, this thing arrives. The problem was is that between phoning for a taxi and the taxi arriving, you entered this twilight zone of uncertainty and fear. Where is it? Has he arrived? Is he round the corner? Go out on the street to check. OK? Here, you can watch the guy approach, and you can go, he's stuck at those traffic lights. I'll have another pint. Now, the certainty thing is the thing I mentioned earlier is so important. The single best bit of client advice I ever gave in 25 years of my working life was simply to tell British Airways never to put the word delayed on a, on a departure board without some duration. I said, make it up if necessary. I'm not sure that was ethical. <laughs> but genuinely, if you put delayed 60 minutes, delayed 90 minutes, delayed 20 to 40 minutes, we can all cope with that information. We go, OK, I'll go and sit down. I'll go and do some work. I'll do this. If you put simply delayed, you might as well just put up be unhappy on the board <laughs> because the effect is indistinguishable from the two. So understanding some of these things seems to be hugely important in that most of the time, the part of the brain that does the talking is system two. It's the, basically, it's the big bullshitter um, that um, thinks it's the Oval Office when in reality it's the brain's press office. It thinks it's actually making decisions, whereas most of the time it's hastily cobbling together a post-rationalised justification for a decision that was taken somewhere else. Okay? Most of the time what we people actually say as a rationalisation is a post-rationalisation of, of act actions generated by parts of the brain which are opaque to introspection. And if we're not careful, we talk to System 2 and we design for System 2 and you create a world which has that kind of bizarre thing of kind of high-speed rail networks where everything's very fast, everything on a spreadsheet looks really impressive, but the seats are awful. You know, there are no tables. You know, all that kind of thing. And it's a kind of you know, ridiculous world which is effectively designed by spreadsheet which becomes more and more alienating to the people who actually live in it. What's fascinating about all these experiments, they actually scale up. You can take the smallest experiment in the smallest thing, something you've discovered in marketing through a tiny banner ad, and if you codify it, it's kind of fractal. Human behaviour is kind of fractal. If you codify that weird anomaly, you can actually scale it up big. Uh, Laurie Santos, who's the leading ap aponomist in the world, uh, the study of e the economics of the higher primates, and makes the point that actually if you understand ape concept of fairness, it completely changes the way you need to respond in a business in a recession. The conventional assumption is you need to lay people off because if you cut people's salary, um, you actually demotivate them. She said, provided you cut higher salaries disproportionately more, the effect, there is no problem with this effect at all. Sorry about that, Martin. Um, but um, <laughs> but uh, the, the concept of fairness is one which, once it's understood, Whole assumptions can actually be overturned. From very, very small ex experiments, you can start to actually scale it up. The final thing is an interesting one for anybody who works in marketing services, which we sort of discover by accident. We didn't realise there was a name for this effect. It's called defensive decision-making. When people make a decision, they think they're kind of looking for the best possible out outcome. Optimization, maximization, to use Herbert Simon's term. Actually, what most of our instinctive brain is doing is saying, in the worst possible outcome, what is the outcome where the consequences for me are least shitty? It's not the same thing at all. It's kind of mini max to anybody who's a game theory fan, okay? What's the outcome where, in the worst, the worst possible outcome for me is least severe? 
And we understood this. We discovered this by because British Airways run a plane from London City to JFK and it's twice a day. And if you live, if you work in Canary Wharf or the city or you live in Essex or Kent, it's a bit of a no-brainer. You can turn up 15 minutes before the plane leaves, hop straight on. It, it's, it's a really, really great service. I mean, it's fantastic. So we asked the question, why isn't this oversubscribed, given that it's all business class, there are only 64 seats a day? The reason we came up with is very interesting. It's defensive decision-making. Once you have an intermediary in a decision, defensive decision-making really kicks in. It's a business class flight. Nearly everybody books through a PA and a corporate travel agent. What the PA and the corporate travel agent know perfectly well is nobody ever got shouted at for booking a flight out of Heathrow. If you book a flight out of Heathrow, which is the boring option, and the flight's delayed, your boss blames British Airways. Do something original and book a flight out of um, London City, if something goes wrong, he might blame you. And the power of that effect, by the way, it's, uh, this has emerged a brilliant book by Gerd Gigerenzer called Risk Savvy, a brilliant decision scientist. And uh, it's so powerful, it affects uh, football penalty taking. The best thing to do, by and large, if you're taking penalties to settle a World Cup match, is actually, provided not everybody does it, is to kick the ball straight down the middle. You will stand a better chance of scoring a goal if you welly the ball straight down the middle and wait for the goalkeeper to dive either left or right, which he does about 90% of the time. The reason nobody does this is because if you do that and fail, you look like an idiot. If you kick left and the goalkeeper goes in that direction, you're unlucky. Kick right, the goalkeeper goes right, you're unlucky. Kick down the middle and if by some chance the goalkeeper stays still, you look like the laziest fool in the world. So even at that level where you have a decision with that many consequences, defensive decision making, it also affects goalkeeper behaviour, which is why they nearly always dive. Because if you just stand still and the ball goes one side of you, you basically look like a fool. <laughs> so that, that, that defensive decision making, there is a way around it, which is you get the manager to instruct player two and player five to welly the ball down the middle, so in the event of failure, they can simply explain they were doing what they were told to do which is an interesting solution to the problem. But that bedevils everything. If you're trying to do a brave advertising campaign, the ad with the animated goat is, might be more likely to succeed, but if it fails, everybody will blame you. Do a boring ad, it may be less likely to succeed, but if it fails, everybody basically thinks you're unlucky. And it affects everything from medical decision-making, uh, hugely prevalent in terms of referrals um, by GPs, for example, which is you can't be sued for doing something, but you can be sued for inactivity. And once the vital thing I'm saying is that once we take the things we already know in this business and do what AbMap does large, which is actually codify them and attempt to make sense of them, the areas of the, of the decision-making world where we can actually get involved multiply by kind of an order of magnitude. Once you've actually codified the thing, you can take what we already knew and start to sell it and push it in places that we never really expected. So that's my really exciting future. The final one, by the way, is defensive decision-making, we discovered, also applies very strongly if you're selling cocktails, which is that no bloke will ever order a cocktail unless there is a photograph of the glass in which it is served. Because even if there's an, only a 0.0003% chance it arrives in a hollowed-out pineapple, defensive decision-making has him ordering a beer instead. <laughs> But that's, that's my final talk. Once again, guys on next. This is going to be fantastic. Um, but genuinely, the whole point is we already knew this stuff. But knowing it is actually only so far. If you can codify it and actually look for recurrent patterns, then you can really take it somewhere large. Thanks very much indeed. Thank you.